This is Friday, April 22, 2016. We are at the Edith North Rogers Memorial Veterans Hospital in Bedford, Massachusetts. And this tape is part of the ongoing Veterans Oral History Project based at the Morris Institute Library in partnership with Natick Pegasus in Natick, Massachusetts. My name is Maureen Sullivan. We are privileged to have with us today Lillian Aronson. Welcome, Lillian. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? I was born July 1, 1917. And where were you born? I was born in Salem, Massachusetts. And you currently live here at the Bedford VA? Yes, I have been here for two years. Your marital status? Single. Do you have children? No. Do you have nieces and nephews? I have 15 nieces and nephews, 12 greats, and 12 great greats. Good for you. Including a set of triplets. Okay, and tell us what Salem Mass was like growing up. Uh, that was the, is, and it still is, the county seat, and it was a busy place, particularly on Saturday night when the marketplace was active. And uh, we were within walking distance of so many different beaches that it was a pleasure in the summertime. And what did your parents do for a living? Well, my mother, of course, just took home care of me. She ended up having six daughters. And uh, my father worked for his father in a wholesale fruit products company. Do you, um, you were born and raised during the latter part of World War I. Do you have any um, stories about that that was handed down? No, I don't really. I understand that, though, that you had an uncle who served as yes, a doctor. Yes, one, one of my uncles had been the doctor during the uh, World War I, mm -hmm. and unfortunately he died quite young. Now, Lillian, uh, tell us about your schooling. Uh, did you go to school? Yes, I went to Salem High School. I graduated in 1935. And what can you tell us about the Great Depression? Well, <laughs> it's a good thing that we were all girls because we wore each other's clothes. And, uh, but uh, we survived somehow. And, uh, and as we grew older, we had a very close relationship. What did you do after you graduated from Salem High School? Well, I had taken the commercial course in high school, and uh, afterwards I did take state exams. So I worked for the state of Massachusetts uh, until I went into the service. So I was on military leave during that period. And you mentioned commercial course, state exam for uh, what kind of work? Would have been office work. Uh, yeah. And do you remember what particular office you worked at uh, at the Commonwealth? I worked for the Division of Employment Security. And uh, the title was slightly different, I think, at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so I commuted to Boston for the job. That must have been interesting before the days of 128. Oh, yeah. How long did it take you uh, from Salem to Boston? Oh, I don't remember, but it was a long trip. It was tiring. If I had decided when I came, if I came back to the same uh, section, that I would live in Boston rather than, of course, at that point, my parents were gone anyway. Ah. All right, so tell us about December 7th, 1941, the day Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Oh, that was such a strange thing. I just didn't believe that that could have happened. And uh, that was on a Sunday, I remember that. And here, and it was just, it gave you a strange feeling. Do you remember what you were doing when you heard about the attack? No, I just knew it was a Sunday, so I wasn't working I know, that day. And uh, you, everybody knew, knew somebody who was over there. 
a good friend of ours had, had a husband who was stationed there in the Navy, and he, he was killed. Um, from the time of Pearl Harbor until you yourself entered the military in 1943, what did you do? Well, I worked for the state, mm -hmm. and you did volunteer work, you know, in different capacity, and mm -hmm. uh, anything that you could help. Do you remember what kind of volunteer work you did? Well, uh, uh, I took horses uh, through the Red through the Red Cross. Remember that, and you did go to some dances, the local. And uh, and incidentally, the Women's Army Corps was not formed until the following year, until 1942. So. Uh, but you were interested in serving in the military. Yes, I was. Lead us to it. And uh, I worked one block from the uh, Army recruiting station in Boston <laughs> where I was working up in Cornwall Avenue. So uh, it, that seemed the likely one to join. I was about to ask you why did you choose the Army over other branches? Uh, and that, uh, at the time you joined, did friends or relatives join? No. So you just kind of walked no. down the street and said, no. <laughs> Okay, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Where were you sent for basic training? Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. Was this the first time you were away from Massachusetts? Yes. What was that like? It was certainly different and interesting to me. And you were actually in your early 20s, if memory serves me right. I was 26 when I joined. Were you considered one of the older recruits? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. So tell us what basic was like. Well, to me it was a lot like camping. In that, <laughs> you were outdoors. Outdoors, yeah. You kept and active. The marching. Marching. And, so <laughs> and was that pretty much what you were expecting? I don't think I really expected anything. <laughs> I had no knowledge of it. You followed orders. It was, uh, it was, uh, <clears throat> were you given any specialized training? Uh, not really at that point. Uh, I had one month of uh, basic training, and then I was transferred to an overseas training company, and we were there for one month before we left for shipment overseas. And where was this overseas? Uh, yeah, we ended up in Virginia at a Fort of them vacation. Now, Lillian, at the time you were in Virginia, you've just finished uh, two months of basic training. Were One you month of basic One, okay. training. And were you attached to any unit or? No, it was part of a signal company. Okay. You know, part, and... Uh, that's where I am now. <laughs> okay, tell us about that experience. I, uh, I was only there uh, three days when I ended up with spinal meningitis and landed in the hospital, and they didn't expect me to live. And that's why I'm thrilled to reach the age of 99 and still be living. <laughs> and how long were you in the hospital? Well, I was uh, probably about a month or so, and then I went home in emergency leave, convalescent leave, and uh, then it was in December that I was finally discharged from the hospital. And this is December of 1943? Three. Okay. Of course, in the meantime, the war is well underway. Do you remember any other, uh, especially when you were on emergency leave back in Salem, uh, anything like rationing, uh, ration stamps, bond drives, yeah, what have rationing, you? you know, all mm -hmm. those. And five of my brothers-in-law were all in the service, some in the Pacific and some in the, uh, over in North Africa. Would you like to mention them? By name? Sure. 
George Goodwin. George Goodwin. Max Blair. Okay. Max. Uh, B L A I R. Yeah. Uh, Joshua Yonas, Y O N I S. Mm hmm. Milton Kellerman. Mm hmm. And the youngest one was Roy Jallen, and he was in a little bit later, I think. Okay. And what branches did the respective brothers in law serve? They were all in the Army. And did all make it back okay? Yeah, you know, my brothers in law did. And two of them lost brothers, so. You remember things like Victory Gardens? No, not while I was in the service. Uh, what about when you were uh, back in yeah, leave? Okay. Yeah. Oh. yeah, people was harmonized. But, uh, and you remember blackouts? Oh, yes. I, I figure with a city like Salem being right by the sea, yeah, blackouts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right, so now we're on, it's December 1943. Your, your leave in Salem has come to an end. What rank were you at the time? The yeah, first one was the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, WAAC, and uh, then that was, I was sworn in a few times. Okay, we're now back. You've just been sworn in to the Women's Army Corps. It is December 1943. You're just getting off emergency leave in Salem. Tell us what happened next. Uh. When I came back, I was assigned to a, a department where we issued savings bonds. And uh, uh, in Virginia, they had liquor rationing, so they did allow the men <laughs> to apply for those things for, on a one-time basis. <laughs> I was quick out there. Never heard of liquor yeah. rationing before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then... Uh, uh, then I was assigned to a troop movement as a troop movement clerk in the food service uh, department. So you knew what meals the men had to have before they left for overseas. What kind of meals did they have before they go overseas? <laughs> they probably got a good meal. <laughs> and where in Virginia were you stationed? That was Camp Patrick Henry, Virginia. That was uh, the staging area for the fort. And what rank were you at the time? Private. You were still a private. Okay. Your troop movement. Uh, tell us what happened next. When the camp was finally closed, that was early in the January, I think, of ninety. Let's see, 96, I guess. I was there, you know, two weeks. Uh, we went to Camp Stoneman, California, which was also a staging area. In that case, it was a case of bringing the men back to the States and back home. Tell us, uh, let's get you back to Camp Pat Patrick Henry for a moment. Tell us uh, what your day might have been like. Well, of course, you're up early for Reveille, and you have a breakfast, and then you go to work and uh, do whatever you had to do there. And in the evening, the uh, service club was coaxed by, and you would go there for dances and things. So you kept busy. Tell us a little more about the uniform you'd wear. At that point, it was a clocky one, you know, the overseas cap and so forth. And uh, I weighed much less <laughs> at that point than I do now. <laughs> if you're so kind as to, uh, I know you have a photo right there on the table. And tell us a little bit about uh, this when, was, when was this that? This was a summer uniform. Mm -hmm. And, uh, okay. And when was that taken? Oh, this was probably, uh, I think this was done in basic, uh, about the time of basic training. Uh, okay. 
Okay. I was young and healthy. <laughs> Do you remember, uh, did you make friends along the way? Yes, sir, did. Uh -huh. Do you have any uh, stories about your days at uh, Camp Patrick Henry? Oh, I enjoyed the dances that they had there. And then uh, also on weekends, sometimes we would go to some place where we could just relax if we wanted to. And how long would your work day be? Eight hours, 10 hours? Well, I'm sure, I don't know whether we got up at five or six, and mm -hmm. then you had the, uh, let's see, bed check would probably be by 10. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can put the photo down now, thank you. And how did you feel knowing you were at an embarkation camp and you're seeing all yeah. these soldiers heading off? Yeah, it was an adjustment mm -hmm. for me at first, but I got over it. Were, um, were these troops, say, heading to Normandy or other places? I have no idea where they went. They would, uh, okay. they would cross the, the Atlantic, you know. Okay. At that point. And how long were you stationed at Camp Patrick Henry? I was there for about two years until the camp closed. Okay, and then you were sent to California. Uh, camp Stillman. As and camp which Stil was in commuting distance to San Francisco, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is wonderful. I bet it was. So this is, uh, you were in Camp Stillman, 1945, later on? No, 46 to 48. 46 to 48. And, and then they opened the WAC training center in, at Fort Lee, Virginia, and I was one of those selected to go. Okay, uh, again, you can take the photo, uh, put the photo back on the desk if you like. Thank you. The WAC training center. Well, let's get um, let's kind of step back to the end of the war. Uh, VE Day in May '45, VJ Day in August. What was those occasions like? Yeah, that was very exciting. Mm -hmm. I'm still there at the, in, in Virginia. How did you find out that Germany and Japan had surrendered? Was it by the radio, scuttlebutt? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sure somebody announced it and, uh, you know, everybody celebrated. Oh, I'm sure they did. So let's get back to the WAC Training Center. This is in Virginia. Where in Virginia? At Fort Lee. Fort Lee. Which was in commuting distance of uh, Richmond. And at the time you entered the training center, what was your rank? I really don't remember what it was. Okay. And what was the purpose of the WAC Training Center? Well, they wanted to continue you know, recruiting uh, girls to go into the service. Mm -hmm. So I, w I worked in the uh, administrative part of it. And uh, were all the, the uh, officers who taught. Were, and uh, so we kept busy with that, and there was always something new. Did you think at the time that you were considered like one of the first, maybe even a pioneer when it came to women going into the military? Well, uh, at that point, there, were, there, didn't, uh, there didn't seem too much difference between those coming in. But at this point, yes. <laughs> At the time, uh, this is now the late 40s, it's the Cold War is just about to begin. What were these incoming WACs being trained for? Well, administration, uh, hospital work, and some place uh, they had uh, learned about signal things. And, uh, but there are so many more fields that are open to them now. Yeah. And how long were you stationed at Fort Lee? I was there for about two years, and uh, then it was time to re-enlist at that point. So again, I asked for California, <laughs> my favorite spot. And uh, so I landed in, at the Fort Sam Houston, Texas. <laughs> 
Boy, you've been around. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I was there for about three years. And I decided that I would be happier if I stayed busy. So I started going to school nights there. So, so I did that. And uh, eventually I did graduate from San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, what, I got a BA. You know. uh, what, um, what was your major? Hmm? What was your major? I had to uh, stop and think. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> what, made you, right what made you decide to stay in the Army instead of going into the post-war civilian world? Well, I wanted to said I was on military leave, so I knew I had a job to go back to. But it, this is all still new and interesting to me. Uh, and uh, so I wasn't ready, and uh, I enjoyed it. So, uh, and I always feel that wherever I left, I left friends, you know. Now you're in Fort Sam Houston. I'm thinking it's now early 1950s? 1950, yeah, okay. to 53 I was there. So now it's the Korean War. Uh -huh. And what was, uh, what was happening with you during that period? Well. I knew uh, when I got there, they were surprised that I had no overseas service, you know. So uh, I knew I was going to have to go somewhere. So a friend had been stationed in Panama and thought it was a wonderful location to be. So I put in for Panama and I was down there until that they closed the wax detachment. And I liked it. Of course, mm -hmm. it was swimming every day and so <laughs> You and think also, I had some college courses while I was down there, too. You know, you think Panama, you think hot and jungles. Yeah. yeah. But you like Panama. I like that, yeah. All right, you're, um, it was three years in Panama or two years? I was there about one year. About one year. Yeah. And they closed the detachment, so we all came back. So, and where was back? <laughs> so temporarily, I was uh, down in Georgia, and uh, then when I put in again, I put in for San, uh, you know, San Francisco, and I got it. <laughs> and you got San Francisco? Yes, I, so I spent six year, wonderful years there, and then when I finally graduated from San Francisco State, I. Uh, had put in for Europe, and I was so I was in Heidelberg for two years. So you finally got to go really overseas. Yeah. <laughs> so and tell that me. was very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you get around to different locations so easily. So and you're in you're in post-war Germany. Yeah. In Heidelberg, yeah. uh, was Heidelberg? Did Heidelberg still have war damage? Or no, no, no. It was very nice, mm -hmm. and I was friendly with uh, the natives there too. Uh, and even after I came back, one of them uh, stayed in touch with me so, until she was telling me after that. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And then I. I had came back and I was in, I said I wanted to continue my education, so they took that into consideration. So I was in Oakland, California, until I finally retired. Oakland was a, a, a base where they sent people overseas. You know. So when did you retire from the Army? I retired March 31, 1964. So I had 20 years and seven months of service. And now, would you like to know what I did after that? Go right ahead. <laughs> Well, I had written a friend uh, 
who was also retired, and I asked her if she would like to go to, to Japan on a military ship. So, and she had been stationed there, knew a Japanese family, so uh, she came out and we had a nice trip, and then she got me an invitation to a Japanese wedding. We visited in their homes, and uh, had a very nice time. And how long were you in uh, Japan? We were all over there, I guess, about, probably about a month. Mm -hmm. And the next year, she asked if I'd like to hop down to Australia on a military hop. So we did that. <laughs> and again, she knew people there. She was a very good person to know. <laughs> yeah. I was a very friend, friend, very lucky. You know. Now, Lillian, uh, you entered the Army during the very heart of World War II, and you left it uh, during kind of like the heart of the Cold War, and America was just getting really involved in Vietnam. What were your impressions over, the past, over that 20-year period? Well, it changed so much. There was so much uh, you know, pros and cons about a lot of the civil, you know. But, uh, and but I always hoped that everybody would come home safe and it didn't work that way. And of course, you witnessed Vietnam, just like a lot of us, uh, the anti-war protesting. Uh, what, was, what was your uh, thoughts on that? Well, I always felt they should support the government. And what did you do? Um, after you left the Army and when you're not doing, making trips with your friend? <laughs> Well, one thing was I visited with my sister in Los Angeles and I got on a national TV program. At that point. No fooling! So that was a thrill. And the family was able to see me back here. What national TV program was it? Do it you... was Queen for a Day. You know, oh, no I kidding! So anyway, I had fun along and so on. Were you queen for a day, or you didn't quite get no, it? No, I just I didn't have a hard luck story. I just said I needed a typewriter because I was going back to college. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so, but you did go back to college. Yes, I got. I have additional credits, but when I came back here, I decided I was better off going back to my state's job. So I did, and uh, I took, uh, you know, exams and bettered my situation, and, uh, and it worked out very well. And what was the state job you worked in at this point? At this point, well, I had taken an exam for the information department and I got a job there, so I was assistant and superintendent there, and that was very good. And incidentally, on as far as writing, uh, the Freedoms Foundation had uh, these competitions for military personnel, and one year the subject was my freedoms and my responsibility. So I won the George Washington Medal, and a hundred dollars for what I had written. <laughs> so. How long were you at the state job? I worked there for about 17 years, and then they had the blizzard in 1978, <laughs> and I got stuck in a hotel that night, so I decided it was time to, <laughs> to call it quick. Where were you living at the time? I was. By then, I was living in Boston. I went back to work not too far from where the office had been. I didn't know that it was, they were building down a government center, but so I stayed at the hotel down that way, and 
Yeah, that's it. You actually worked in Boston during a very interesting period, mid to late 60s, when uh, City Hall Plaza was yeah. being built. What was that like? Yeah. So, yeah, you keep trying to improve it. <laughs> and when they wiped out Scully Square, yeah. they put in the plaza. Yeah. yeah. And did you see the Hancock Tower being built? Yeah. And it certainly changed. And of course, you were dead center in the middle of the blizzard of 78. Yeah. <laughs> so. Lillian, did you join any veterans organizations? Yes, two. Two? The DAV and the JWV. Which is Disabled American Veterans and Jewish? Yeah, Jewish War Veterans. Right, okay. Are you still a member of those groups? I'm a life member. Life? I always found it much easier just to become a life member. <laughs> Well, you mentioned you made quite a few friends uh, during your Army career and after. Do you have reunions? Do I what? Do you have reunions of, so say, your... Uh, I did belong to a group that met here in Somerville, but uh, the local group disbanded. It was uh, one of the WAC vets. Mm -hmm. and, uh, And I, I tried to contact a couple of people that I had known that I had lost touch with. So I asked two nieces, one in San Francisco and the other in Michigan, to see if they can help me. So one sent me the obituary, <laughs> and uh, that was one in San Francisco. And the one in Michigan, it was still existing. She was a little bit younger than I. So we talked periodically. <laughs> Glad to hear that. Well, Ian, how important was it for you to serve in the military? Well, I'm very glad that I had done. I, it, it was important then and it's important now. And as my nephew says, you're part of the greatest generation. And, uh, and so and I'm glad that I could have done a little bit towards helping. I'm going to uh, throw a hypothetical question at you. Suppose you're, you're now 26 and you're interested in entering the Army. Would you still go into administrative work or would you try to go for one of the fields that are now open? Well, I'm not uh, very big or really any strong, so I don't, I don't think uh, those would apply to me at this point. <laughs> I still exercise, so. What do you think about uh, women in, now they're, uh, they're being allowed to go on combat missions and do things that were not allowed to you and your fellow WACs and fellow women in the service uh, back during World War II? I'm sorry. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, let me rephrase that. Uh, wh what do you think about uh, today's women in the military being offered more opportunities, including going into combat? I think it's right. And, uh, yeah, I understand you um, lived in Brookline for about 30 years. Yes, I did. I was very happy there. The hospitalization made a difference. <laughs> and uh, what, did you, what did you do in Brookline? In Brookline? I lived in senior housing there, and the senior center was very close to it. I could go over there and participate in whatever I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And they were very nice. And, mm -hmm. Now, Lillian, are there any other um, stories you may recall from your career in the Army, whether during World War II or afterward? I can't think of any right now, but <laughs> I'm sure there are. <laughs> well, how about this? Um, did uh, superior officers, for example, did they uh, treat you all right? Oh, yes. 
Yeah, one of my last jobs in San Francisco, I think I was very fortunate. I worked for Lieutenant Colonel Margaret Thornton, and she was such a wonder woman. She handled all the, the women uh, army activity in six army areas, and she was very gracious and very knowledgeable, and, and uh, that was a really pleasure in working there. Mm -hmm. Just curious, when, uh, when you first entered the Army, did you already know how to drive? I have never driven. No kidding. <laughs> I know. I used to kid about it and said, I should have got married if only to learn how to drive, because that's what my sisters learned. <laughs> I didn't seem to need it either. The location was good for public transportation, or I had friends who drove who were willing. Yeah. Lillian, is there anything else before we wrap up this interview? Uh, oh, let me think. There must be something. Okay. Oh, sure. uh, go ahead. I mentioned that. Well, let's see. I thought I could say, I must have had something down here. Well, parenthetically, did uh, any of your younger relatives join the military? Any of my what? Your younger relatives, like your nieces or nephews? No. No? No. No. They all had the maternal instinct, I think. <laughs> Okay, well, if there's nothing else, Lillian, we're going to wrap up the interview now. Lillian Aronson, we thank you so much for taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. And thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm.